Then we'll get started. Lord, it's a privilege for us to be together uh, in this room, which is filled not only with mechanical warmth, but also the warmth of your spirit. Thank you for welcoming us here. Thank you for the gospel, which is our calling, which gives us life and hope and peace. I pray that uh, the words that are spoken here today, the witness to the gospel, the witness to the scriptures would be faithful to all that you have in store and have in mind for us. And I pray that you would uh, empower me right now with your gift to be your agent of the gospel. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do, 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 do. Isn't that how it goes, you know? We are getting close. I see one slide up there. All right. I was actually thinking a little while ago, in the middle of the service, uh, this thought's been on my mind a bit lately. <clears throat> I'm really not competent to do anything except the one thing that I do, which is kind of strange to me. I look at, I look at the things that you do, the kinds of work that you do, the efficiency with which you do it, the imagination, the effort that's involved, and it just ain't me. <clears throat> so I have always, I've grown to be more and more uh, grateful that God had called me to do this one thing that I do, and I do hope and pray that I will be able to do it with some efficiency and some effectiveness today. <clears throat> and it's going to be really awesome when we get to PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to put on the screen here, I can do this part anyway before we get started. Uh, um, several of you have asked about a, a, a series of reflections that I write out from time to time. Uh, I call them soundings. If you're interested in receiving those things, we can put you on the distribution list. All you have to do is send me an email, and that's what this first slide has <laughs> when it comes. I'm so glad you're doing this and not me. It would be on fire. <laughs> you know, we stay at our daughter Angie's house when we were here in Houston, and uh, they reserved a bedroom for us. And yesterday, when uh, as Terry was leaving the bedroom, turned off the light switch, and the uh, the fan and the fixture fell out of the ceiling, <laughs> hanging by us. You know, two wires. That's all. So I thought it's not a big problem for a guy like me. I can manage this stuff. So I. Went out and got myself a pair of wire cutters. <clears throat> Climbed up on the bed. She says, Rudy, do you need to turn off the power into the house or anything? No, no, it's fine. It's off at the switch. Unfortunately, I didn't check to see if it was off at the switch. So when I clipped it, there was this poof, and everything went black. So that's the limit of my technical ability. You're probably wishing you got this on about a Thursday, didn't you? So you could have a couple days to load it in. All right, well... Um, Okay, we're talking about King David. This is the third session uh, in three. Uh, um, in a moment, hopefully they'll come up on the screen, a picture of Sophia. I wish that she was here today. Sophia is a uh, social robot, and she has the capacity to mimic social behavior and induce feelings of love in human beings. A robot that can do that. She was granted in 1917, or, uh, 2017, she was granted Saudi Arabian citizenship. First known robot to be a legal citizen of a country. Pretty amazing. We are on the edge right now, as you know, of being in a time where we're going to have to, to uh, give special thought to what it means to be a human being. This is of interest in biology. They have their way of determining uh, a person or a being's humanity or in philosophy and in theology also for us. We have the Bible. That's what we use. And the Bible tells us in the very first chapter, you'll be familiar, everybody remembers this, in the beginning God created everything and he created man, that's his first chapter, in his image. And then a little bit later on there's a little 
addition to that, in his image and his likeness, we were talking about this last week, all of us are created, every person is created in the image of God, but it's our choice whether or not we want to be in the likeness of God. So that's what we're doing with our lifetime. We are trying our best to grow into the likeness of God. And this happens a little bit at a time, step by step. We're almost there. Way to go. Thank you. I worship you. <laughs> I adore you. <laughs> Hopefully it works. If not, you can. So let's see. Are we going forward? Well, we're there. Okay. We're sort of up, up and running. There she is. Sophia, what do you think? Looks pretty real to me. Oh, we've got the, this is not just the PowerPoint. This is everything that I have to say. So, so we'll just skip down through here. We'll, we'll pretend that we know what's going on here. Anyway, uh, this process of becoming into the likeness of, of God happens a little bit at a time. Paul puts it this way in uh, one of his letters. He says, now the, Spirit, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of God, as though being reflected in the mirror, are being transformed into that same likeness from one degree of glory to another. That's how we're being transformed. That's how we become uh, more and more into the image and likeness of God, a little tiny bit at a time. So we're trying to make progress by degrees. You know, think of a compass, 360 degrees, and every one of those degrees, you can hardly tell the difference. That's the way progress happens in most all of our lives, so much so that we can hardly even tell the difference. And it will oftentimes also feel as though we're doing all the work, when in fact it's God who's working quietly in the background, bringing us to transformation. So we're looking at King David. King David is uh, not a model human being. His uh, life is triumphant, and it is tragic. Uh, last week, we left him in the wilderness where he had been chased by King Saul because Saul perceived him to be a threat to his kingship. He lived out there for 20 years. Uh, many of the Psalms reflect David's life in the wilderness. But eventually, what happens this Next thing happens, yes. <clears throat> Can I do it this way? Yeah, probably going to be this. Sorry, we got to. Are these cables long enough? Perhaps. This is where the fan falls out of the ceiling. <laughs> and there is a poof. Easier for me to do this with my fingers. Thank you. All right, now we can do this. Okay, so uh, eventually uh, Israel goes to war again uh, with the uh, Ammonites, I think it was. And <clears throat> because Saul has alienated himself from David, he no longer has David, who was his chief warrior, to fight for him on his behalf. Remember, David was the one who defeated Goliath and the Philistines after that. So uh, Saul has to go into war on his own, and as it turns out, he dies in battle. He's mortally wounded, and he does what all noble kings did in those days. He falls on his own sword, and not only Saul, but also Saul's armor bearer, and also his son, Jonathan. Now, we haven't talked about Jonathan. I, I, I apologize for that, because Jonathan plays a significant role in the life of, of King David. He was the son of of Saul. So uh, try to imagine how complicated a relationship would be if your best friend was the son of a king who was trying to kill you. That's the way it was between David and Jonathan. <clears throat> they loved each other like brothers. So what kind of a day was this when Saul and his armor bearer and Jonathan all died? Was it this, this kind of day? You know, fireworks? Was it uh, this kind of day? You know, sometimes the, the event's so great, you just got to kiss somebody. <clears throat> Was it this kind of day? Ah, oh, boy, what a year the Texans have given us. <clears throat> no, it was none of those kinds of days. Uh, 
When these events took place, David went into mourning. I mean, Saul was dead. The threat to his leadership was gone. He was a free man, really, in that part of the world. But he grieved his passing. You know, I think being human, we've been talking about, David, in these terms. Being human means being willing to bear the pain of the world. For a long time, you know, when I was doing this preaching and teaching thing all the time, I would tell people that if I had uh, Smithsonian Magazine, 60 Minutes in the Bible, I could preach forever. I mean, they're just such great resources. <clears throat> For a long time, Terry and I watched 60 Minutes on Sunday evenings when we could. I mean, it's so many great stories are told so well there. But during COVID... When the news was so grim, it just got to be hard for us to watch. So there's another program on at the same time called America's Funniest Home Videos. That's what we turn to. <laughs> we started watching America's Funniest Home Videos because sometimes you just want to laugh. The Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. You're probably familiar with this painting. Edvard Munch, a uh, Norwegian artist, late 1800s, he was walking with his friends along a, a fjord when the sun was going down, and he said when the sun dipped behind the clouds, it turned everything blood red, and he thought he could hear, piercing through all of nature, the infinite scream. Now, why is that painting so popular? I mean, this this work of art sold in 2012 for $120 million. I mean, you look at it in a way you could say, well, that's just kind of one, kind of one click above finger painting. <laughs> but somehow, what is it? It captures something. The scream, it goes through nature, it goes through all of our lives. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. That's what is said about Jesus. So a lot of people tell me they don't watch the news anymore. Too depressing. I get it. But really, in a way, that's why we're here. We're here to share the suffering of the world. You know, we, we, we grieve for lots of things. We grieve for um, what we have had and lost, like some of us right now are grieving <laughs> aging, for instance. We can't do the things we used to be able to do. I preached in Col at Colorado Springs this, this past summer uh, at a church, and there was kind of, I had a tight connection to get to the airport, and it's a ways from Colorado Springs to the Denver airport. I don't know if I'm going to make it. And drop me off at the front door. I'm running inside. There's a huge line. I mean, it was June, so vacation, and people are out there going through security. I thought, that's it, never going to make it. I made it through one turn, you know, and that little thing goes back and forth and back. And this um, airport security woman comes over and she points at me and she says, come over here. And she, she pulls up the little strap and she lets me through and closes it up before anybody else could go. And I thought, you know, God really takes care of me. <laughs> I am somebody special. But then a little bit later in the summer, Terry and I were also traveling, and I saw an airport security do the same thing to another person, and I realized at that moment, it was done to me because I look so old. <laughs> she thought this poor guy's never going to make it. You know, I, I look at my hand. <laughs> I think from time to time, you realize what a good friend your hand is. So obedient, it does all the things you ask it to do, but mine, I can't, I can't ask it to do as much as I used to. Anyway, so you get the idea. <clears throat> we mourn things that we've had and that we have lost. Some of you know all about this, don't you? I mean, if we went around and took a poll today, uh, we'd all be in tears by the time it was done. Terry and I talk about this. We're getting to the age where, in fact, we went to a funeral for a friend yesterday, and we spent most of the time on the way home just uh, talking about our services. What are we going to do? If you go first, if I go first. Some of you have been down there. You know that? You know about that with the child? So many things. 
David grieved because of the friendship he had with Jonathan. Sometimes it's all you can do. And sometimes we grieve because of the things we've never had, things that we wished we'd had. David wished that he had some kind of a special relationship with Saul. He worked on it so hard, and it just never was. And I don't know how to tell you this, but some of you were just never going to be on the PGA Tour. <laughs> you may want it, but it's never going to happen. You're never going to be the vice president, the senior vice president of your company. That stuff's never going to quite work out with you relationally. We, we grieve for things that never have been. Like I, serving a church in Elko, Nevada, this is like a million years ago, uh, there was a man who moved into the community. He was an a orthopedic surgeon. He made a big splash when he arrived. It was a small town, and so people like that made a big impression. He was handsome, and he had a great-looking wife and kids, and uh, he, he was just good at everything, an athlete in every way. He came storming into my office one day, halfway between tears of grief and tears of rage, and he said, all my life I've tried to get the favor of my father, and today he died and never gave it to me. Hmm. Sometimes we grieve what we're never going to have. You know, 70% of the Psalms are laments. I did a study once on Paul, and I was working with a guy who's a seminary professor. Uh, just an excerpt, expert in Paul and Pauline theology, and I was trying to present the various themes that Paul wrote about, and I presented the paper. He said, well, it's all pretty good, but what about suffering? And I had missed it completely. But now I read Paul and I it's everywhere. Paul even goes so far as to say is that we're supposed to complete what is lacking in the suffering of Christ. I take that to mean we're, we're to take on this burden. Superman, you know, uh, Superman Returns, it's a movie about Superman going away and then he comes back and Lois Lane's upset because where did you go and why didn't you tell me and he's trying to explain it to her and he finally says, well, listen to me. I want you to see something. So he takes her up into the air, you know, they levitate like Superman can do. Looking out over Gotham, the city, it's, it's nighttime, 10 million lights on the hillsides. And he asked her, what do you hear? She said, I don't hear anything. And he says, I hear everything. He goes on to say, you know, you say people don't need a savior, but... Every day I hear people crying for one. Superman. So, you know, I want to add this little postscript so you, lest you think that you have to go around in a grievous mood all the time. Paul offers this wonderful little statement. He says, we have gifts that differ according to the measure of grace that God has given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, minister and ministering the exhorter and exhortation, Passion, and he says, leaders in the proportion to diligence and compassion, uh, uh, compassion in proportion to cheerfulness. So we grieve. It's one way to be human, but we do so. There's just an edge of cheerfulness to it, you know, because we, we don't grieve as people who have no hope. All right. So being human also means waiting humbly before the Lord. Uh, a lot of things have happened now. Goliath is dead. Saul's dead. Philistines are, you know, on the run. And David's established a great city in Jerusalem. And he's built himself a wonderful castle to live in. And <clears throat> looks like, you know, so many things have happened. And he recognizes Paul. This is one of the reasons where uh, David was different from Saul, because David recognized the hand of God in things. We are saying last week, Saul was just spiritually dull. But David sort of understood things from one of his psalms. The Lord is king. He's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. 
Your throne established from of old, you are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, more majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Read the Psalms, you'll find, in addition to the laments, you'll find things like this everywhere. So uh, at this point, David realizes all the things that God has done for him, and he gets to thinking, in light of everything that God has done for me, what can I do for God? Well, I mean, what kind of work can I do for him? So he, he decides, uh, I'm going to build God a temple. He tells this to the, uh, to the local prophet, a man named Nathan. Says, this is what I want to do. And Nathan said, you know, go do it. God will be with you. But that night, the Lord speaks to Nathan and said, it's not such a good idea. So Nathan then goes back the next day, and he says to uh, David on behalf of the Lord, I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Forget about building me a house, I'm building you a house. The kingdom that I am shaping here isn't what you do for me, it's what I do through you. And I think Paul had this in mind a thousand years later when he said, do you not know that your body is a temple? Your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit from God. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. And the th tribute that the Scriptures uh, pay to David in this moment is that David went into the Lord and sat down. That doesn't sound like very much. Sometimes just going quiet matters. Maybe you saw on the news this week, there was a, 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 someone did a study on what is it that constitutes true intellectual brilliance? It's not IQ. It's the ability to listen to someone else, to be fully engaged in a relationship with another person. So David goes in and sits down. He's, gonna, he's not going to tell the Lord what he's going to do for the Lord. He's going to listen for what the Lord's going to do through him. You know, uh, you might remember how uh, Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day, there are many who will say to me, Lord, Lord, did not cast out demons in your name, prophesy in your name, do great deeds of power in your name. And the Lord will say, get away from me, I never knew you. You know, sometimes we think that true faith is doing great things for God. Not necessarily always that. Sometimes it's just listening. Sometimes it's, as I put here on this slide, sometimes it's going into a holding pattern where you're not doing really much of anything. You know, we, uh, we like to think of, of our faith in intellectual terms as well. You know, we, you, you uh, Anglicans, you have your Nicene Creed. We Presbyterians, we have our Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father, you know, and all the little things that come after that. Each one of those is a little precept that we... You know, we'll, we will judge people on the basis of what they think about the resurrection and the virgin birth and all of that, like that's faith. Well, there's, there's, I suppose there's an element of faith in all that, but faith is really, some, faith is all, also just waiting. It's just, sometimes faith is just going into a holding pattern. My literature professor, William Stafford, a great poet, poet laureate of Oregon and uh, with the Library of Congress as well. I went to a poetry reading once, and somebody asked at the end, um, so what's the secret of writing poetry? And he said, the secret of writing poetry is you wait. Sometimes that's faith. Sometimes it's doing great things for God. Sometimes it's just the most heroic thing you can do is just wait. 
wait as we say on the Lord. So while he's waiting, um, another thing that characterizes the human being is that um, he also gave generously. Now David asked the question, is there anyone remaining from the house of Saul to whom I might show the kindness of the Lord? Uh, so David's no longer surviving in the wilderness. He's not in the battlefield. So what's he going to do? Well, he goes in search of anyone who might be left over from Saul's household. Now, you probably are aware that in, in those times, and even to this day in certain circumstances, when a king dies, I mean, the custom is you get rid of all his relatives. One way or another, you get rid of them, and that's the way it was. And people thought when Saul died, David was going to get rid of all the relatives of Saul. But now David's in power, and he asks this question, is there yet anyone to whom I might show the kindness of the Lord? And they come across one person, Mephibosheth. He's the grandson of Saul. Uh, and uh, after Saul died, they hustled him out of town because they thought surely David was going to come and kill all the family. And They're get, trying to get out of town, going so fast that Mephibosheth falls down, breaks both of his ankles. So he's a cripple for the rest of his life. The word comes to him now as an adult that King David wants to see him. Of course, he thinks this is it. It's curtains for me. When he arrives at King David's presence, King David says to him, I want to restore the property of your grandfather. Father Saul, and I would like to supply you with good for the rest of your life. You know, I think sometimes being human is this business of developing a cult and cultivating a generous spirit toward each other. I, uh, <coughs> Russ talks about this wonderfully in his, in his message this morning. So I can't remember which saint it was. I don't know if it was Anselm or Augustine or you know, one of the saints. Uh, talks about being robbed one day on the road, and the robber says, give me everything you got, and he hands over all of his coins. Later on, he's just grateful the robber left it at that. But then as he's walking along, he feels something tapping against his, his shin, and he realized, that, oh, I forgot. I sewed a couple of coins, you know, kind of my emergency money, in the hem of my robe. And so he runs and, cap and catches up with the thief and says, I I you asked me for everything. I'm sorry. I didn't give you these things. I found these in my robe. I mean, can you imagine the effect that would have on a person? So David shows he's, he's human by what he does with Mephibosheth. Now, being human also means experiencing God's grace in this not-so-perfect world. So, uh, I ask you, what do you know about David? You say, well, I know about Goliath and I know about Bathsheba. You know, this, this waiting time is difficult. David's kind of in waiting. Uh, I remember somebody asked Bill Gates, read an article, uh, Bill Gates' interview, how have you managed to do all of the things that you have done? He said, well, I don't mow my own lawn. I do mow my own lawn. And so I've decided that's really the main difference between Bill Gates and me. <laughs> all right, so uh, fast forward a little bit. It was now the time of year when kings go out to war. Uh, David's encouraged to stay behind. I, I'm, I'm imagining that they're saying to him, listen, you're more valuable to us alive than you are dead, so why don't you just stay here in Jerusalem? But, you know, David is a man of action. He's not a guy who sits in the palace by himself. I can imagine David even got kind of high when it comes to war. Some guys just like fighting. So David's having a bit of a midlife crisis. I think we, we oftentimes talk about this as um, halftime. In fact, uh, New Year's Eve party at a neighbor's house. One of the neighbors and I were talking. He had a very successful uh, insurance business, and he was stepping back from it, put somebody else in charge, only goes in once or twice a week, but he was just mid-50s. He's just lost. What do I do now? David was, I think, there on the, in his castle, kind of not sure what to do. Favorite movie of mine, Never Cry Wolf. It's about this guy named Tyler. Uh, he's a biologist, 
He hears about a precipitous decline in the number of caribou in the Arctic, so he decides he's going to go up there and study them, even though he's never lived outside, never lived in a tent, but he packs up all the stuff he thinks he'll need. He charters an airplane, a little single-engine plane. It's held together by, what do they say, bolts and chewing gum. And they're flying along, Tyler and Ro Rosie, I think that's his name. Anyway, they're going through this pristine, magnificent countryside, all white, covered with snow, mountains everywhere. And they start talking about, the, the Rosie says, why are you coming up here? It's gold, isn't it? You're looking for gold. I said, no, it's not gold. He said, well, I'll tell you where the gold is. He says, it's south of 60. I think that must be the 60th parallel. He said, it's sitting in everybody's wallets, and they're sitting there watching TV, bored, he says. They're bored. Then he says, you know what the cure to boredom is? And just when he says that, the engine on the airplane quits. All you hear is the sound of the wind rushing by on the plane, starting to dive toward the mountains. He looks at him, he says, the cure to boredom is adventure. <laughs> Turns around and reads, fumbles around in a tool kit behind him, finds this wrench. He opens the airplane door and he climbs out onto the wing. He said, you take the stick. He said, I don't know how to fly an airplane. He says, the solution to boredom is adventure. I'm telling you, adventure. Well, there was no more adventure in David's life. He's bored. That's my take on it anyway. So he goes up on the roof of the castle one evening. He looks down onto the roof of the castle next door, and he sees Bathsheba, it's a beautiful woman, calls for her, lays with her, she gets pregnant. Now he's got a problem. Her husband, Uriah, is one of David's leading generals, and David has sent him out with the rest of the army to do battle. So now he's got to fix this problem, otherwise he's going to get tagged with uh, adultery, you know? Sleeping with another man's wife. So he calls for Uriah, brings him in from the battlefield. And he says, uh, listen, I just want to give you a day or two of R&R, &R, so why don't you go down, be with your wife, enjoy the evening. But Uriah is such a noble guy, he refuses to do that. He, he, uh, he puts a mat outside the door and sleeps on the mat and won't go into his wife. So the next day, David does the same thing, only now he gets him drunk. So get his inhibitions down. Doesn't change Uriah. So now David's still got a problem, and this is his solution. He sends the head of the secret police out onto the battlefield where Uriah has now returned, and he says to him, I want you to fight in a part where our army will be especially vulnerable and put Uriah on the front of the line, and then when the fighting becomes most difficult, I want you to pull back and leave Uriah by himself. That's what they did. And Uriah died. And then David... He takes Bathsheba as his wife, like he's the generous man now going to take care of the general's daughter. But there's this verse. But what David did was displeasing before the Lord. Yikes. So... I've got all these little slides here. I'm just going to read this. I don't know any other way to do this except to read it. It's some of the, I think it's some of the most uh, dramatic, magnificent works in all of literature. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man, had no, poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and grew up with him and his, with his children. It used to eat his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or from his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. 
Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then David said, Nathan said to the man, You are the man. Can you imagine what that moment was like? Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You've taken his wife to... To be your wife, you've killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. For you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in sight of the very sun. But you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin, and you shall not die. Nevertheless, by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord. The child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, became very ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. David fasted, went in, and lay all night on the ground. The elders of his house stood beside him, urging him to rise from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we tell him the child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw his servants were whispering together, he perceived that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David rose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then he went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servants said, what is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you rose and ate food. He said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David consoled his wife Bathsheba, went to her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he named him Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by the prophet Nathan. So he named him Jedidiah because of the Lord. <clears throat> this is maybe David's greatest legacy just his repentance, being human, means confessing and repenting. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. You know, God doesn't save us from our suffering. He saves us in it, as you have heard. But the trouble doesn't end there. Uh, David's family is pretty complicated because he had many wives. And, you know, we don't judge him in a thousand years before Jesus by our standards, uh, 2,000 years. 
on the other side of Christ, it's just the way things were done. But it creates awkward families because that meant he, he had children, uh, brothers and sisters who were really half-brothers and half-sisters. His favorite son was one named Absalom. Uh, his uh, favorite son, Absalom's half-brother, Amnon, raped his half-sister, Tamar. And uh, Absalom was so infuriated and incensed by this that he went in and he killed his half-brother, Amnon. And when, when David heard about it, he what do I do now? So he sent Absalom into exile for three years. And then when, David, when Absalom came back, David ignored him. David refused to see him or to speak to him. And as a result, Absalom called together his own army. And he rebelled against his father, David. And a war broke out, and Absalom was killed. Oh, my son, Absalom. My son, my son, Absalom. Would that I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Uh, being a Christian doesn't shield us from suffering consequences. David sins, the rape of Bathsheba, the murder of Uriah, the rejection of Absalom. You know, a thousand years later, Jesus was going to tell a story about a rich man who had two sons. And one of the sons asked for his portion of the inheritance, and the, the young son went away and squandered it all of the passage says, on dissolute living. And then when he came to himself, he returned to his father. I'm not worthy to be called your son. And his father ran to him and greeted him, and even before he could get the full confession out, he said to his slaves, go quickly, get the robe, the finest one, and, and sandals for his feet, and ring for his finger, and kill the fatted calf, this son of mine who was dead is alive, who was lost has been found. I think Jesus was thinking of David at the time, David who rejected his son Absalom, and now the prodigal who comes home to a, a loving, welcoming father. So here we have the sins of David. <clears throat> what kind of life is David's? I guess that's the question we've seen. It's been a roller coaster, it's been triumph and tragedy. A number of years ago, some friends invited us to go to the opera. I'd never been to the opera before, didn't know anything about it. So we went, and the opera was Tosca, a typical opera where, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a love-death thing, and uh, love is forbidden, and there's always a sinister plot in it. And this woman, Tosca, she, she works with, uh, with the sinister police chief so that she can arrange to have the man that she loves set free from his bondage so the two of them can run off together. I'm leaving a lot of stuff out, but you get the idea. <laughs> and the, the deal is that, that this man she loves is to be put before the firing squad, and the chief of police will replace the bullets in the firing squad with blanks. And then they will fire their gun, and he'll fall down and pretend to be dead. She will come and rescue him, and they'll go off and live happily ever after. So the moment comes, they fire their guns, he falls down. She goes and discovers that he, she had been tricked. They didn't fire blanks at all, but bullet, bullet, bullets and her husband, or man she loves is dead. So she gets up, walks to the edge of the palace wall, throws herself off and dies. And then the house lights come up in the, in the auditorium, and people are gathering up their purses and their coats. And I, I said, that's the end? That's it? <laughs> Would have been nice if someone had lived. My friend said, yes, but then it wouldn't have been the opera. So what's David's life? Is it an opera? Fortunately, 
it's not. Because of David's willingness to confess, <clears throat> create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. David's joy was eventually restored. So how do I bring all this to an end? David is not a model human being. He's a man of extraordinary gifts and courage and tenacity. With him, there are many, many triumphs, but also much tragedy. You know, we don't live in the Iron Age anymore, but really since the age of David, not much has changed when it comes to the sorts of things that were a problem for him in his life. So I will say this. These are the conditions in which human beings must live their lives. These are the only conditions in which human beings can live their lives. That's why the Bible remains constantly contemporary to us. There is virtually no, if I summarize this whole thing, there are virtually no conditions that prevent the Spirit of God from working in us. We see that in David. Nothing stops God from doing what God's going to do. God can use any condition in your life to advance his kingdom's influence. David is so important, not because he is so good, but because God is so good to him. So uh, David's life brings uh, an old story to mind about a, um, a cowboy who was charged with responsibility for breaking wild horses, and there was one wild horse he couldn't break, and so he did the thing of last resort. He, he, he tied it to a mule. <clears throat> and then set them off. And here goes the wild horses bucking and kicking up dust and sand everywhere, and they disappear over the horizon. And about a week later, they come back. Only this time, you know, it's the mule that's in the lead. It's all covered up with dirt and scratches from the wild horse. But the wild horse has been trained. I don't know, I look at that picture and... I don't know about you, but I feel like that mule's looking right at me. <laughs> Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. Tis grace that's brought us safe thus far. Grace will bring us home. I think Jesus is saying, let me take the reins of your life. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The time David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron, 33 years in Jerusalem. He died in a good old age, his 71st year, full and satisfied with days, riches, and honor. Solomon, his son, reigned in his stead. I think of those words. David went to his bed, and he was satisfied. Satisfied. And it wasn't because of anything he had done, but it was because of what God had done in him and through him. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both this day and always. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.